The Cube presents HPE Discover 2022. Brought to you by HPE. Welcome back to the Cube's coverage. We're wrapping up day two, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. We got some friends and colleagues, longtime friends. Crawford Del Pret is the president of IDC. Matt Eastwood is the senior vice president of infrastructure and cloud. Guys, thanks for coming on and spending Great some time. Great to see you guys. Got <laughs> fun to do it. Awesome. Crawford, I want to ask you, I, I think this, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was your first physical directions as, as president. Is that true or did that you is, do one in 2019? Uh, no, we did one in 20, we did, we did one and in you 2019. Were at the time. I was president at the okay. time and then, and then everything started. Well, well how was directions this year? You must have been stoked to get back together. Yeah, it was great. Clients. I mean, it was actually pretty emotional. You know, I'll I mean, it's, it's a community, right? I mean, we have a lot of customers that have been coming to that event for a long, long time. I mean, to stand up on the stage and look out and see people, you know, getting a little bit emotional and a lot of hugs and a lot of bringing yeah. people together. And this year in Boston, we were the first event really of any size that kind of came back. And I kind of didn't see that coming in terms of how people, how ready people were to be together. Because when did you do, you did it April in Boston? Yeah, we did it in March. In March. Yeah, it was a game day decision. I mean, we were, we had negotiated it, we were going back and forth, and then I kind of made the call at the last minute to say, let's go and do it. And in Santa Clara, I felt like we were kind of opening up the crypt at the convention center. I mean, all the production yeah. people said, you know what, you guys were literally the first event to be back. And attendance was really strong. You know, we, 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 we got over a thousand, it was, it was really good. Good, and it's yeah. always a fun, I mean, when I was there, it was, yeah. it's a big deal, you guys yeah. prepare for it. Yeah. Some new faces yep. uh, up on the stage. Yeah. So, so Matt, um, you've been doing the circuit, I take it, like, <laughs> like all top analysts, super busy, right? This is kind of end of the spring, I mean, I know it's summer. Right, that's right. But um, how do you look at, at Discover relative to some, some of the other events you've been at? So I think if you go back to what Crawford was just talking about, our event in March, I mean, March <laughs> was sort of the, the reopening, and yep. there was, I think people were just, felt so happy to be to be back out there. You still get a little bit at, at, at these events, I mean, because for each each company, it's their, their first time back at it. But I think we're starting to get down what these events are going to feel like going forward. Um, and it, I mean, there's good energy here. There's been a good attendance. I think the, the interest in getting back live and having face-to-face -face meetings is clearly strong. Yeah, I mean, this definitely shows that hybrid's the steady state, both events, cloud, yeah. <laughs> virtualization, <laughs> remote. So what are you guys seeing with that hybrid mode just from a workforce? Certainly people are excited to get back together, but it's going to continue. You're starting to see that digital piece. How is that impacting some of the, some of the customers you're tracking? Who's winning and who's losing coming out of the pandemic? What's the big picture look like? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you take a look at hybrid work, um, people are testing many, many, many different models. And I think as we move from a pandemic to an endemic, we're going to have just waves and waves and waves of people needing that flexibility for a lot of different reasons, whether they have uh, you know, pre-existing conditions, whether they're just not comfortable, whether they have people who can't be vaccinated at home. So I think we're going to be in this hybrid work for a long, long time. I do think though that we are going to transition back into some kind of a normal. Um, and, I, and I think the big difference is that I think leaders back in the day, a long time ago, when people weren't coming into work, it was kind of like, oh, I know, nothing's going on there. People aren't getting work done. I think we're over that stage. Yeah. I think we're now into a stage where we know people can be productive. We know people can effectively work from home. And now we're into the reason to be in the office. And the reason to be in the office is that collaboration, it's that mentoring, it's that, you know, think about your 25 year old self. <laughs> Do you want to be staring at a windshield all day long and not yeah. kind of building those relationships? People want face to face. It's difficult. They I, want yeah. face to face. I mean, I wouldn't, and you guys got a great culture and it's a yeah. young culture. How are you handling it as an executive in terms of is there a policy for <laughs> hybrid? Or, yeah, so, so, so at IDC what we did is we're in a pilot period and we've kind of said that the summertime is going to be a pilot period and we've asked people, we're actually serving, <laughs> shocker, we're serving, <laughs> right? but, we're, but, we're, but, but we're actually asking people to work with their manager on what works for them. And then we'll come up with, you know, whether you're an uh, out of the office worker, which will be less than two days, a hybrid worker, which will be three days, or uh, in, in, in the office, which is more than three days a week. And you know, we all know there's, there's, there's limitation, there's, there's, there's variability in that, but that's kind of what we're shooting for and we'd like to be able to have that in place in the fall. Are you pretty much there? Yeah, I'm, I, am, I, I am there three days a week. I, I, Mondays and Fridays. Because you got the Friday. CEO radius, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm the same way, I'm in the office every day. Yeah. Uh, smaller smaller yeah. office, but. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the numbers. We were yep. chatting earlier trying to squint through, you guys are you know, obviously the gold standard for what the market does. What happened in, you know, during the pandemic? What happened in 2021? And what do you expect to happen in, in 2022 in terms of 
IT spending growth. Yeah, so this is, this is a crazy time, right? We've never seen this. You and I have a long history of, uh, of tracking this. So we saw in, 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 in 2020, you know, the market decelerated dramatically. Um, the G GDP went down to a negative like it always does in these cases. It was you know, probably negative six in that, in, that, in that kind of a range. But the first time since I've been tracking IT, which goes back over 30 years, tech didn't go negative. Tech went to about just under 3%. And then as we went to 2021, we saw you know, everything kind of snap back. We saw tech go up to about 11% growth. And then of course we saw you know, GDP come back to about a 4% you know, kind of range growth. Now what's, I think the story there is that companies, and you saw this anecdotally everywhere, companies leaned into tech. Uh, company, you know, I think, you know, Matt, you have a great statistic that 80% you know, of companies used COVID as their point to pivot into digital transformation right. and to invest in a different way. And so what we saw now is that tech is now where I think companies need to focus. They need to invest in tech. They need to make people more productive with tech. And it played out in the numbers. Now, so this year, what's fascinating is we're looking at two vastly different markets. We got gasoline at $7 a gallon. We've got that affecting food prices. Uh, interesting fun fact recently, it now costs over $1,000 to fill an 18-wheeler. All right, based on, I mean, this just kind of can't continue. Do so you think about it? Don't put the boat in the water. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> good, 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 good luck if you, if, you, if you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, a family has kind of this bag of money, right? And that bag of money goes up by maybe three, four percent every year, depending upon earnings. So that is sort of sloshing around. So if food and fuel and rent is taking up more, gadgets and consumer tech are not, you know, you're going to use that iPhone a little longer. You're going to use that Android phone a little longer. You're going to use that TV a little longer. So consumer tech is getting crushed. You know, re really, it's very, very, and you, you saw it immediately in ad spending. You've seen it in Meta. You've seen it in Facebook. Consumer tech is doing very, very, it's, it's tough. Enterprise tech, we haven't been in the office for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. We haven't upgraded whether that be campus Wi-Fi, whether that be uh, servers, whether that be uh, commercial PCs, as much as we would have. So enterprise tech, we're seeing double digit order rates. We're seeing strong, strong demand. Um, we have combined that with a component shortage and you're seeing some enterprise companies with a quarter of backlog. I mean, that's you know yeah. really unheard of. At higher of prices, which well, also and therefore that drives, I mean, that drives higher it, prices. It shouldn't be that way. If there's a shortage of chips, it shouldn't be that way. Right. But it is. But it is. But it is. And then you look at software, and we saw this. You know, we've seen this in previous cycles, but we really saw it in the COVID downturn, where uh, in software the stickiness of SaaS means that you just, you're not going to take that stuff out. So the, the second half of last year, we saw double digit order rates in software. Surprise, we're seeing high single digit revenue growth in software now. So that we think is going to sustain, which means that overall IT demand, we expect to be between five and 6% this year. Okay, fine, we have a war going on. We have you know, potentially uh, a recession. We think if we do, it'll be with a lowercase r. Maybe you see a banded down to maybe 4% growth, but IT is going to grow this. Is it, a, is it both the structural change of the disruption of COVID plus the digital transformation yeah. together, or is it? I, I, I think you make a great point. Um, I, I, I think that we are entering a new era for tech. I think that, you know, Andreessen's famous Wall Street Journal op-ed yeah. 10 years ago, Software is Eating yeah. the World, was absolutely correct. And now we're finding that Software is, is eking into every nook and cranny. People have to invest. They, they know disruptors are coming around every single corner. And if I'm not leaning into digital transformation, I'm dead. So, so the number of players in tech is, is growing. because Well, the number of players in tech. The industry's number, coming in. Yeah, the industry's coming in. So yeah. I think the interesting dynamic you're going to see there is now we have high interest rates, yeah. which means that the price of funding these companies and <laughs> buying them and putting debt on them is going to get higher and higher, yeah. which means that I think you could you could see another wave of consolidation mm -hmm. because tech, large yeah. install based tech companies are saying, well, you know, well, I'd like that. And now uh, I they're, they're, the four hundred nines are being reset too. That's another point. Right. Yeah, I mean, so if you think about this this transformation, right? So it's all about apps and data and differentiating and apps and data. What the the big winner the last couple of years was cloud, and I would just say that if this is the first potential re recession that we're talking about, where the cloud service providers. So I think a cloud as an operating model, not necessarily a, a destination, but for these cloud service providers, they've actually never experienced a slowdown. So how, and, and if you think about the numbers, 30% of, of the typical IT budget is now quote unquote cloud. And 30% of all expenditures are IT related. So there's a lot of exposure there. And I think you're going to see a lot of, a lot of focus on how we can rationalize some of those investments. Well, that's a great point. I want to dub, just double click on that. So yeah, the cloud did well during the pandemic. We saw that with SaaS. 
have you guys tracked like the TAMs of what got pulled forward? So the, the big discussion about something that pulled forward because of the pandemic, um, like Zoom for instance, obviously everyone's using yeah, Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Was there fake TAMs? There was one, a uh, couple analysts who were pointing out that some companies were hot during the pandemic will go away. That that TAM doesn't really exist, but there's some that got pulled forward early that's where the growth is. So is there, a, is there a line between the, I call fake TAM or pulled forward TAM that was only for the pandemic situationally? Um, Devices might be Like virtual example. event, I mean, virtual event software was one. Yeah, I know right. Hoppin's got laid a lot of layoffs and so that was kind of gone, coming, right. coming and going. Then you yeah. got SaaS, yeah. which got pulled forward yep. and it's not going away. But it's sustaining, yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah. But, it's, but, but, but it's sustaining. Um, you know, I definitely think there was a there was a lot of spending that absolutely got pulled forward, and I think it's really about CEO's ability to control expectations and to kind of message what it what it looks like. Um, you know, I think I look. I, I I think virtual event platforms probably have a role. I think you can de you can definitely you know raise your margins in the event business significantly using those platforms. There's a role for them, but if you were out there thinking that this thing was going to continue, then you know that that yeah. was unrealistic. You know, Dave, to, to, to your point on devices. I'm not necessarily yeah. you know, sure. I think, I think we definitely got ahead of our expectations in things like consumer PCs. Those things will go back to historical growth rates. Yeah, I mean, you got the install base is pretty young yeah. right now. But I think the one way to look at it too is there was some technical debt brought in because people didn't necessarily expect that we'd be moving to a permanent hybrid state two years ago. So now we have to actually invest on both. We have to make, create a little bit more permanency around the hybrid world. And then also like Crawford's talking about the permanency of of having an office and having people work in, in multiple modes, yeah, it actually requires investment in both the office and also in so the So you're saying market. operationally you got to run the company and do the digital transformation to level up to hybrid? Yeah, yeah, it, it just the way people work, right? Okay. So, so yeah. you know, you, you basically have to, I mean, even for like us internally, Crawford was saying, we're experimenting with what works for us. My team before the pandemic was like one third virtual, now it's two third virtual, which means that all of our internal meetings are going to be on, on Teams or Zoom, right? Yeah. They're not going to yeah. necessarily be, hey, just come into the office today because two thirds of people aren't in the Boston area. Right, Matt, you said you see cloud as an operating model, not necessarily a place. I remember when you were out, I was on the, on the, on the, on the Zoom, when we first met Adam Solipsky. Yep. Um, he said, you were asking him about you know, the, the on-prem guys and he's like, ah, it's not cloud. And he kind of was very dismissive of it. Yeah, yeah. I want to get your take on you know, what we're seeing with as a service. GreenLake, Apex, Cisco's got their version, IBM, Pure is doing it. Is that cloud? I think if it's, I, I don't think all of it is by default. I think it is, if, I actually think what HPE is doing is cloud because it's really about how you present the services and how you allow customers to engage with the platform. So they're actually creating a cloud model. I think a lot of people get lost in the transition from you know, CapEx to OpEx and the financing element of this, but the reality is what HPE is doing, and they're sort of setting the standard, I think, for the industry here, is actually setting up what I would consider a cloud model. Well, sure. in the early days of, of GreenLake, for sure, it was more of a financial, you know, <clears throat> right, It was kind of bespoke, agency. right? But yeah. now you've got 70 services, and so you can, you can build that out. But, you know, we were talking to Keith Townsend right after the keynote, and we were sort of un unpacking it a little bit, and I, I asked the question, you know, if you, if you had to pin this in terms of AWS's maturity, where are we? And the consensus was 2014, console, <laughs> billing, is that fair or unfair? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, um, I think it's, well, cl cloud's come a long way, right? So it'd be, I, be, I, I think 2014's probably a little bit too far back. Because uh -huh. you have more modern tools but I, today, I, Kubernetes is... Yeah, and then, but you also have, I would say the market's still getting to a point of, of, of readiness in terms of buying this way. So if you think about the HP's kind of strategy around edge the core platform as a, as a service, you know, we're all big believers in edge and the apps following the data and the data's being created in new locations and you got to put the infrastructure there. And for an end user, there's a lot of risk there because they don't know how to actually plan for capacity at the edge. So they're going to look to offload that, but this is a long-term play to actually uh, build out and deploy at the edge. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's yeah. a five, 10 year play. Yeah, I mean, I like the operating model. I agree with you, Matt, that if it's, if it's cloud operations, DevSecOps and all that, all that jazz, it's cloud, it's cloud operating. And, and right. a public cloud is a public cloud hyperscaler on premise and the storage folks were presented. That's a single pane of glass. That's old school concepts, yep. but cloud based. Yep. Shipping hardware, it's auto configures. Yeah. That's the kind of consumption they're going for. Now, I like it, but then, I, then they got the partner led thing. Is the partner piece, how do you guys see that? Because if I'm a partner, there's two things. Wait a minute, am I a bottleneck to the direct self-service, or is that an enabler to get more cash to make more money if I'm a partner? 
because you see what Accenture is doing with what they do with Amazon and Deloitte and et cetera. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, right? Like, if I'm a channel partner, I'm making more cash. Yeah, I mean, well, and those channel partners are all in transition too. They're trying to yeah, figure right. out, <laughs> right, right, right. are they, you know, what are their managed services going to look like? You know, what kind of applications are they going to stand up? They're they're not going to just be reselling. I technology. bought a big yeah, house right, and right, a right. boat. Yeah, yeah. The boxes yeah, yeah. I was yeah. selling. I want to ask you guys about growth because yep. you know the, the big three cloud, the big four, growing. Pick a number. I don't know, 30, yeah. 35 yeah. percent yeah. revenue, big. And like you said, it's for thirty percent of the business now. I think you know, Dell's growing double digits. I don't know how much of that is sustainable. A right. lot of that is PCs, yep. but still, it's strong growth. Yep. I think Cisco was promised 9%. In, in that right range. about that? Yep. Something like that. I think IBM, Arvin's at 6%. Yep. And I think HPE has said, hey, we're going to do 3 to 4%, right. which is so really sort of lagging, and which I think a lot of people in Wall Street is like, okay, well, that's not necessarily so compelling. Right. What does HPE have to do to double that growth or even triple that growth? Yeah, so they're going to need, so, so obviously you're right. I mean, being able to show growth is tantamount to this company getting you know, more attention, more heat from, from investors. I think that they're rightly pointing to the triple digit growth that they've seen on GreenLake. I think if you look at the trailing you know, 12 month bookings, you got over you know, $7 billion, which means that in a year, you're going to have a significant portion of the company is as a service, and you're going to see that revenue that's ratable being you know, recognized over a series of months. So I think that this is sort of the classic SaaS trough that we've seen applied to an infrastructure company where you basically have yeah. to kind of be in the desert for a long time. Yeah. But if they can, I think the most important number for HPE right now is that Green Lake bookings number. And if you look at that number and you see that number you know, rapidly come down, which it hasn't, I mean, off of a very large number, you're still in triple digits, they will ultimately start to show revenue growth um, in the business. And I think the one thing people are missing about HPE is there aren't, there are a lot of companies that want to build a platform, but they're small and nobody cares. And nobody, yeah. say they throw a party and nobody comes. HP has such a significant install base that if they do build a yeah. platform, they can attract partners to that platform. What I mean by that is partners that deliver services mm -hmm. on GreenLake that they're not delivering, they have the girth to yeah. really start to change an industry and change the way stuff is being built. And that's the bet they're making, and frankly, they are showing progress in that direction. I, so I buy I, that, I, I, but the I one do, thing that do. concerns me is they kind of hide the ball on services, right? Yeah. And, I, and I worry about that. Is like, <laughs> is this a services kind of just, you know, same yeah. wine, new bottle, or? Yeah, or so, so I, I would argue that it's not about hiding the ball, it's about eliminating confusion in the marketplace. This is the company that bought EDS only to spin it off. <laughs> okay. And so you don't want to have yeah, yeah. a situation where you're getting back into services. Yeah, they're no, not the only ones. They're yeah, not the only yeah. ones who does. I mean, look at it, I, the way IBM used to count and it still I, I get cloud. it, I, I get it. But I think and, and, it's, it's a really about clarity of mission. Well, well, no, I mean, point next, they are in the TS business. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah, a point yeah. of it. And, and, and it's important prop chart for them. At the top, right, the global 50 say, there's still a lot of uniqueness in what they want to buy. So there's definitely a lot of bespoke kind of delivery that's still happening there. The real promise here is when you get into the global 2000 and, yeah. and can start them to getting them to consume very standardized offers. And then the margins are, are healthy. Yeah. And they got, you know, they're what, low 30, 33, 33%, I think 34% last quarter gross yeah. margin. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's solid, you just compare that with Dell's, I don't know, they're happy with 20, 21% if Correct. they can even Correct. get that, yeah. which is, you know, I, I, I'll come back, go ahead. I want, I want to ask no, no, you guys no, about- No, I want to, no, I want to just, he said one thing I liked, yeah. which was, I think he nailed it. They have such a uh, big install base, they have a great channel, they know how to use it. Right. It's a real asset. Yeah. And Microsoft, I remember when their stock was trading at 26, when Ballmer was CEO. Yeah. What they did with, no, they had Office as, and Windows, so yep. a little bit different, yep. but similar strategy, leverage our install base and yeah. bring something up to them. That's what you're kind of connecting the dots Absolutely, to. you have this velocity uh, machine with a significant girth that you can now move to a new model. They move that to a new model. To Matt's point, they lead the industry, they change the way a large swath of customers buy, and you will see it in steady revenue growth over time. Okay, so I have Just to, in that. All right. Well, so, so your point is the focus. You know, yeah. the right, it's the right focus. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree. What's, their, what's their other move? What's their other move? The, the progress. In, triple digit booking growth yeah. off, a, off, a, off a number that gets bigger and bigger. In spite okay, of what's, the, what's the scoreboard? Okay, now, the look at the growth, that's the scoreboard. What are the signals are you looking at on the scoreboard, Crawford and Matt, in terms of success? What are the benchmarks? Is it ecosystem growth, number of services, uh, triple growth? Yeah. What's the, what are some of the metrics that you guys are going to be watching and we should be watching? 
yeah, I mean, I don't know if you want to jump in. I mean, I think ecosystem is really critical. Yeah. You want to you want to have well, and and you need to sell both ways. Like HPE needs to be selling their technology on other cloud providers, and vice versa. You need to have the Veeams of the world on you know offering services on your platform and and kind of capturing some some motion off that. I think that's pretty critical. The channel definitely. I mean, you have to help. And what you're going to see happen there is. There will be channel partners that succeed in transforming and succeeding, and there'll be a lot that go away. And that some, some of that's uh, generational. There'll be people that just kind of age out of the system and, and just go home. Yeah, yeah, so I would argue it's, 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 it's going to be uh, bookings, growth rate, it's going to be retention rate of the, of, of the customers uh, that they have, and then it's going to be that, that um, you know, ultimately you're going to see revenue um, growth and which is that revenue growth is going to have to be correlated to the bookings growth for Green Lake. What's the Achilles heel on on HP? If you had to do the SWAT, what's the what's the W for HPE that they really need to pay attention to? I mean, they they need to continue their relentless focus on cost, particularly in the com, in the core compute you know segment. They need to be they need to be able to be as cost effective as possible mm -hmm. while the higher profit dollars associated mm -hmm. with Green Lake and other services come in and then increase the overall operating margin and gross margin. Picture. I, I mean, I think the biggest thing is they just have, they have to continue the motion that they've been on. Right. And they've been consistent about that. Mm -hmm. What you see, where others have, have kind of slipped up is when you go to, to customers and you present the, the OpEx as a service and the traditional CapEx side by side and the customers put in this position of trying to detangle what's in that OpEx service, you don't want to do that, obviously. And, and HP has not done that. But we've seen others kind of slip up. And but a lot of it. companies still want to buy CapEx, right? Absolutely. They're, they're liquid and, and yep. I think. I, but you, you, know, shouldn't do a, you shouldn't do that bake off by putting those two offers out. You should basically ascertain what they want to do. What's kind of what Dell it. does, right? Hey, how, yeah. what do you want? Yeah. Oh, we got this, we got this. <laughs> <laughs> On one hand, we got this, the other hand, we got that. <laughs> right. Uh, the two hand sales rep. No, this <laughs> CapEx thing's interesting. And if you're Amazon and Azure and, and GCP, what are they thinking right now? Because remember what, four years ago, Outpost was launched, which is essentially hardware. Yeah. Right? It's just cloud operating model. Yep. Yeah. They're yeah. essentially bringing Outpost. This is what they got, basically. Is Amazon and Azure, like, is this a blip on the radar for them? How would you, what, what are they thinking in your mind? If we're, on, if we're in their office, in their brain trust, mm -mm. are they laughing? Are they like saying, oh, they're scared? Is this a real threat, I know, I, opportunity? I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say they're laughing at all. I, I would say they're probably discounting a little bit and saying, okay, fine, you know, that's a strategy that a traditional hardware company is moving to. But I think if you look underneath the covers, you know, two years ago, it was, you know, pretty basic stuff they were offering. But now when you start getting into some, you know, HPC as a service, you start getting into data fabric, you start getting into some of the more um, sophisticated services that they're offering. And, and I think what's interesting about HP, what my, my take is that they're not going to go after the 250 services that Amazon's offering. They're going to basically have a portfolio of services that really focus on the core use cases of their infrastructure yeah. set. And, and I think one of the danger things one of the one of the red flags would be if they start going way up the stack and yeah. wanting to offer the entire application stack. That would be like a big flashing warning sign because it's not their sweet spot. It's not what they had. So they but machine had learning, machine learning, and quantum. Okay, one you can argue might be up the stack. Machine learning, quantum should be in their wheelhouse. I would argue or, machine learning is not up the stack because what they would focus on is inference. They'd focus on learning. If they came out and said machine learning all the way up to the you know what a what a, what a drug discovery company needs to do. So they're, they're bringing it down. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. No, no. I think they're focusing on that middle layer, right? That 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 okay. data layer. And I think that helping companies manage their data, make more sense out of their data, structure their data. That's core to what they want to do. I, I feel as though what they're doing now is table stakes. Honestly, I, yeah. I do. I do feel like okay, hey, fine. Finally, you know, I say the same thing about Apex. You know, yeah, say, we finally got it. It's like, okay guys. Welcome you know, to the party. Like, great. Welcome oh, to the yeah. party. I, I, but I, the one thing I would just say about, about AWS and the other big clouds is whether they might be a little dismissive of what's truly going to happen at the edge. I think the traditional OEMs that are transforming are really betting on that edge being a huge play and a huge differentiator for them where the public clouds obviously have their own bets there, but I think they were pretty dismissive initially about how big that was. I don't, I don't think anybody's really figured out the edge yet. Yeah, uh, well, so that, that's an it's a battleground. That's but, what he's saying, I think you're saying. But on the that's ecosystem, I, I want to say, up the stack, I think it's the ecosystem that's got to fill that out. Yeah. You, you got to see more governance tools and catalogs and AI tools and- It yeah, immediately and goes more tools. It goes more vertical when you go edge. It, it, you're going to have different conversations. And they're lacking. Yeah, and they're, no, but, they're, but, here, but yeah. they're in there though. They're in the verticals, HP's in the verticals. Yeah, for sure, but they got 
got to build out an ecosystem. Like you walk around here, the data, the, the number of data companies here, I mean, Starburst is here. I'm actually impressed yep. that Starburst is here because yep. I think they're a yeah. forward-thinking company. I want to see that times 100, yeah, right? I mean, that's HP, the, HP's in all the verticals. That's, I think, yeah. the point here. So like, they should be they, able to attract that ecosystem and build that, that flywheel. That's the, that's the hallmark of a cloud, that marketplace. Yeah, I, it is, but I think there's, a, again, I go back to they really got to stay focused on that infrastructure yeah. and data management. Like. Yeah, but they'll be focused on that, but, but their ecosystem. Their ecosystem will then take it up from yeah. there, and I think yeah. that's the next stage. And that ecosystem's got to include OT players and communications technologies yeah. players as well, right? Because that stuff gets kind of sucked up in that, in that edge. Do you play. feel like HPE has a, has a leg up on that, or like a little, a little bit of a lead, or is it pretty much um, you know, even race right now? I think, I think the big infrastructure companies have all had OEM businesses yeah. and they've all played there. It's, it's, a, it's also helping those OT players actually convert their own needs into more of a software play. And, and yeah, not so much on well, physical. Yeah, you've been you've been following it. You guys both have been following HP and HPE for years. They've been on the edge for a long time. I've been focused on they this have. edge. Yeah. Now they might not have the product traction, right. or they might not develop as fast. But industrial IoT and IoT, they've been talking about it, focused yeah. on it. I think Amazon was mostly like, okay, we got to get to the edge, and like the enterprise. And, and I think HP's got a leg up, in my opinion, on that. Well, the question I, is, I, can they execute? Yeah, I mean, PTC was here years ago on stage yeah. talking yeah. about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you think about, if you think about the edge, right? I mean, I would argue one of the best acquisitions this company ever did was Aruba, right? Yeah, I mean, totally it, it, it yeah. basically yeah. changed the whole conversation of the edge, changed the whole conversation. It became GreenLake. It was GreenLake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it became a big part of it. But, but I mean, you know, I mean, they, they, yeah. they went after going selling edge line servers, yeah. and frankly, it's, very difficult to gain traction there. Yeah. Aruba, huge it's area of differentiation, and I think the March announcement was when they brought Aruba management into. You know, yeah, yeah. What, what, totally right. Last question. Yeah. Love that. What, what are you guys saying about the the Broadcom VMware acquisition? What's the what are the implications for the ecosystem for companies like HPE and just generally for the IT business? Yeah. So you want to start? Yeah, sure. I'll start. I'll start there. So look, you know, we've you know spent some time uh, going through it. Spent some time you know speaking. Uh, to the to the to the folks involved, and, and 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 I got to tell you, I think this is a really interesting moment for Broadcom. This is Broadcom's opportunity to basically build a different kind of a conversation with developers to uh, try to invest in. I mean, just for perspective, right? These numbers may not be exact, and I know a dollar is not a dollar. But in two thousand one, anybody remember what HP paid for Compact? Eight 20, billion? 20 something? Twenty-five billion dollars. 20, yeah. Twenty-five billion dollars. Wow. VMware just got sold for sixty-one billion dollars. Wow. <laughs> okay, that gives you a perspective. Yeah. Now again, I know a dollar is yeah. not a dollar. Yeah, two thousand yeah. still versus, big numbers versus two thousand twenty-two. So, having said that, if you just did it to, to to basically build your DCF model and say, okay, over this amount of time, I'll pay you this, and I'll take the money out over this period of time, which is what people have criticized them for. I think that's a little short-sighted. I, yeah. I think this is Broadcom's opportunity to invest in that product and really try to figure out how to get a seat at the table in software and pivot their company to enterprise software in a different way. They have to prove that they're willing to do that and then frankly, that they can develop the skills to do that over time. But I do believe this is a, a different, this is a pivot point This is not for CA, Broadcom. this is not CA. It's not CA. In, yeah. in, my, in my mind, it can't be CA. They would, they would destroy too much value. Now, you and I, Dave, had some, had some conversations on Twitter. I, I don't think it's the step up to them sort of thinking differently about Semiconductor Dyn, doing some custom semi. I, I don't think that's- Yeah, really, I agree with yeah, that. I think, I, I yeah. think this is really about- I think that's about, too aspirational yeah, for Yeah, them pivoting the company they could justify into the, the uh, getting a seat at the adults table in software. Is really well, if, if Broadcom has been squeezing their supplies, we all hear the scuttlebutt. Yeah. If they're squeezing, they can use VMware to justify the prices. Yeah. Maybe use that hostage and that install base, that's kind of my conspiracy theory. I think they've told but, us what they're yeah. going to do. <laughs> I do. Maybe it's not like CIA. Matt, I what's think your, it's, I think what's it's your maybe conspiracy more like, theory? like semantic, but what do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's still, I mean, so VMware, there's really nobody that can do all the things that VMware does today. So it'd be really impossible for an enterprise to just rip them out. But obviously you can, you can sour people's taste and you can very much influence the direction they head in with the collection of, of providers. One thing, interesting thing here is, was it 37% of VMware's revenue is sold through Dell? So there's, there's a lots of dependencies. It's not, it's not as simple as, I think John, you're, you're right. You can't just pull the CA playbook out and rerun it here. This is a lot more complex. It's yeah. a lot more volume. Of, of, of distribution, but a fair amount of VMware's install base. Dell's influence is still there, basically. Is in the mid-market. Yeah. It's, right. not, it's what, not something that they're going to touch directly. Yeah, but you That's think about what point. VMware did. I mean, they kept adding new businesses, buying new businesses, 
I mean, is the security business going to stay? Networking you know? security, I think, are interesting. Well, right. VMware, they, they, they have the same about, customers uh, over and over. Computing. They haven't yeah, done anything. Yeah. Yeah. VMware has the Microsoft. same customers. What new customers? So imagine yeah. simplifying <laughs> VMware, right? right. It becomes yeah. a different equation. It's really interesting, and to your point, yeah. I mean, I think Broadcom is, I mean, Tom Krause knows how to run a business. Yeah, right? yeah he knows so. how to run a business. He's gonna, I, th I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be an efficient business. It's going to be a well-run business, but I think it's a pivot point for Broadcom. It's amazing to me. Broadcom sells to HPE, they sell to Dell, and they've got a market cap that's 10x. You know? okay. Yes, yeah. All right, we got to go. <laughs> guys, awesome hey, great conversation. To see you guys. Thanks, thanks a lot. Really yeah, thanks for having us on. Okay, listen, uh, day two is, is a wrap. We'll be here tomorrow, all day. Dave Vellante, John Furrier, Lisa Martin. Lisa, I hope you're feeling okay. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching theCUBE, your leader in enterprise tech live coverage. <laughs>